So for who, who wouldn't know me, my name is Peter Welle. I sort of discovered Bitcoin, I think, late 2010. Uh, started looking at the source code early 2011, and I think I've been a core developer for the Bitcoin project since May 2011. Uh, so today I'll be talking about some uh, uninteresting changes in Bitcoin Core 0 0.10, not 1, 0 0.10. Um, reason for calling it this way, so the, the um, announcement here called it uh, the newest features. Problem is most of them are really not all that directly visible or, or things you will notice. Um, but uh, so I'll, I'll talk about more uh, the things specifically things that I've been interested in working on lately uh, that you might expect in 0 0.10. So, um, so here's a short overview of the things I'm going to talk about. Um, the header's first synchronization mechanism that will be in 0 0.10, uh, the new lib consensus library, uh, the BIP66 soft fork, which will require strict DER signatures. I'll talk more about that later. Um, a new library we're using for elliptic curves, uh, libsecp 256 k one uh, Some few things about build process. Um, I'll shortly say something about fee estimation and watch-only wallets, as I think those are also interesting. To say. And then I'll talk some numbers and... and uh, give a prospect for the future. You'll notice my slides become increasingly ru uh, rough as uh, the pr presentation progresses. Um, doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they're mostly here for me to know what to talk about. So, um, the first thing uh, is uh, headers first. So, um, this is probably the most visible thing of uh, what you will notice. Uh, it's a new block downloading and validation mechanism that's in 0 0.10. Um, and you'll notice it's much faster and much more robust. Uh, I can't make any promises about how fast it will be exactly for you on your system, but we've definitely seen full synchronizations from scratch in three, four hours. Uh, thing. Um, to explain what headers first is exactly, I'll first dive into the mechanism and uh, what has changed. So let me start by how we did it before. Um, I'm not sure how familiar people are with the actual wire protocol that Bitcoin uses, but um, pretty much what we try to do when a new full node comes online is you ask your peers that you connect to uh, for the blocks that they know about through a message called uh, get blocks. And they reply with a bunch of hashes. And it's very important that these are just hashes. This is the problem. We don't know anything about them, but they're hashes. So the only thing we can do when a particular peer informs us about a particular block is just download it. And we have no idea where it will fit in the chain. We have no idea of its height. Uh, or, or how it's connected to any of the other blocks. So we download it, um, and as the actual validation mechanism, uh, which we need to, to check whether a block is valid and all the transactions in it uh, apply to our wallet and everything, can only be fully processed when we have all, the, all its ancestors, um, you get the problem that, well, what if we don't have those ancestors yet? Um, and how previous ver versions of Bitcoin Core did this, they kept blocks in memory until uh, all parents of a particular block were fetched and then it, it got processed. So this was a problem uh, because it, it's... Um, in, in, in 0 0.9, we made actually a, a particular change to limit the amount of blocks that were kept in memory because uh, often the downloading mechanism got sorry, uh, got confused and we got a blow up of, of how much memory was actually used during synchronization. So in 0 0.9 we changed this and limited it to um, a fixed set of, of blocks, I believe 750. And this, this may have caused more harm than uh, it, it solved. It, it, it prevented mem the memory usage of nodes from blow blowing up, but it also resulted in, if, if your synchronization somehow went wrong, um, 
you would download the same blocks over and over because we would download them into memory and the buffer would overflow so we would remove some and we would uh, we've seen benchmarks where like every block was downloaded two or three times uh, during the synchronization and this is obviously not what we want. Um, the reason we had to keep them in memory is um, we don't know anything about them. We cannot validate them. So we don't want to give an attacker on the network just the ability to connect to you and say, hey, I have a block, here's a block, I have a block, here's a block, and you can't do anything with them and all you do is store them on disk. So that's the reason for keeping them in memory and not on disk. Um, so this was a, a increasingly erratic process that um, as the, the downloading itself took longer and longer, it got more and more confused by nodes trying to, to announce new blocks to us. And we had several hacks to uh, make sure we would, in every case, always still synchronize. But it, 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 in practice, it was only downloading from a single peer, because you can't download what you don't know about yet. So, um, this is all going to change in 0.10. Um, this old mechanism, we're still using it, but instead of down using it for downloading full blocks, we're now using it just for the headers. So, these headers in Bitcoin are 80 bytes per block, so uh, currently I believe it's around 28 megabytes of data you need to download for just the headers. It takes a few minutes. Um, and this allows us to basically do most of the, the things that are hard to fake for an attacker uh, in advance. So instead of just knowing the hashes now, we know all the headers uh, and build in memory a full uh, representation of the block tree with all branches uh, that our peers know about. And we fully validate it. Of, of course, not the transactions, because we don't know those yet, but we do know that the difficulty is correct, that the proof of work is correct, that they're syntactically correct. So th this is expensive to, um, to attack. So once we did that, and we have th this header tree that's uh, pre-validated, um, and uh, I show it here as a sequential process, but in practice it's really done already during the downloading of, of the headers. Uh, once we know about a particular part of the chain and have validated the headers, we start fetching from all the peers we have, all the uh, uh, all blocks that, that we can. So um, this means we are no longer even trying to download the blocks in order. Um, uh, an, an effect of this is uh, your blocks end up on disk out of order. Some software may uh, need, need changes for this, but it does mean that we are much, much faster. Uh, it's not the only, ch uh, only advantage here, but uh, I'll talk about that later. Um, we do try to limit how much they go out of order. So uh, I, I believe we use a window of around 1,000 blocks. Um, so you never download a block that's more than a thousand ahead of the latest you have validated, um, just to prevent run runaway uh, things. Okay, so um, back to the big picture. Um, the result of this is you're using uh, less memory during synchronization as well, as we don't have these orphan blocks anymore. So by, by orphan blocks here, I mean uh, blocks without a parent. Uh, it's often used in a different meaning as well. Um, so, but these blocks without a parent don't exist anymore uh, in, in the new software because we only ever download a block about which we all have already the, uh, validated headers and just can immediately store it to disk because of this. Um, it, it's def it requires a few common line flags, but you can run it in under 500 megabytes now, full node synchronized. Um, Something else uh, that I would like to talk about is that headers first allows us to reduce the importance of checkpoints in software. <laughs> and this may sound weird to some. Uh, I, I understand that there's uh, among many people a misunderstanding about what checkpoints do. So um, checkpoints really do not add security. Uh, the idea that some people have as well, checkpoints are used to prevent these big reorganizations in, in, in the software, right? You have this uh, hard-coded checkpoint and your software will never ever uh, move away from it. Well, 
if we ever get to a point that that mechanism is actually needed and we have an actual checkpoint in the software that actually prevents the chain from reorganizing, we have much bigger problems. It means the consensus mechanism has completely failed. Uh, so if you are relying on developers putting checkpoints in the software to make sure your software is getting onto the right chain, why are we using all this proof of work and mining? So, um, of course, then what is the reason that we have checkpoints? It's in order to make a particular optimization safe. Um, what it does is because we know a particular checkpoint, um, we disable signature checking for every block before that checkpoint. And th this was necessary because in the previous downloading mechanism, we really had no idea of what blocks were to come. So uh, all, all you do is you have a particular block and now you have to check. Um, and if you want to skip things, we need to know something about it in advance. And that was what these checkpoints were. Um, with headers first, where we first have these headers, um, we can avoid this. In, instead of uh, using a hard-coded point where we switch between actually validating and uh, skipping the signature checking. Um, you can use something like, if there is enough proof of work on top of a particular block, we're going to skip it, because this is impossible to fake. Um, maybe make this configurable or, or, or something. Um, th this is not something we're doing yet in 0 0.10. It may be controversial, but I, I think it, it's something we really need to do in particular to counter the misunderstanding about Bitcoin security model that they bring. So uh, not so long ago, uh, I found this um, review of various altcoins uh, in someone's GitHub repository where he went over a, a bunch of features they should have to be secure. And one of them was, oh, this one does not have enough checkpoints. This is insecure. Uh, so. Um, I think we need to get rid of this and, and uh, go for something better. Uh, there's more obvious uh, Im improvements, like we, we get a much better information about the state of the network. So um, warning the user that there's a big reorganization or a big fork going on is much easier as we learn about it much sooner before we're actually fully validating. Also not something we're using yet, but uh, we will. Uh, and it's just much less hacky. Uh, you have no idea. <laughs> um, so let me get on to the, the next change. Um, so this is a new library that we're shipping with the 0 0.10 releases. Uh, it's called libconsensus, and it's a reusable library for Bitcoin's consensus rules. So f from other software, it has a trivial API. It's a C API, so it should be callable from uh, many other uh, languages. If necessary, it's a DLL file or an SO file, I think, on OS X. It's a dilib or something. Um, uh, for now, it's just scripting, so it, it allows you to evaluate a particular Bitcoin script. Uh, here is an input, here is an output script uh, that's, that tries to spend it. Uh, tell me whether it's valid or not. That's all it does. Um, and let me try to explain why I believe that this is a really important thing to have. Uh, let me first divert a bit about consensus systems. So um, consensus systems like Bitcoin, um, are very unlike many other software projects. In, in most software, we have either explicitly or implicitly some uh, idea of what the system should behave like, and we have a specification, and you have your software that implements it, and if you find the discrepancy between the implementation and the specification, you change the implementation, because, well, it's not doing what it's supposed to do. Um, for the, the actual consensus critical part in Bitcoin, and, and by that I mean the rules that determine whether a particular block is valid or not. Um, this is different, because imagine you would try to, we with the community would try to come up with a full rule book that uh, would uh, say exactly when and how a particular Bitcoin block is valid, um, and everyone would agree that this is exactly what we want. And now we notice that you actually uh, deployed software on the network has a slight subtle change. 
uh, compared to the specification, well, we would have to change the specification, not the implementation, because changing the implementation would mean uh, a very likely risk for a fork in the network. So it, th this is really a, a, a strange thing, but in, in, in Bitcoin nodes, all individually need to come to exactly the same conclusion about whether a block is valid or not. And th this is surprisingly hard. We've seen uh, various cases in, in the past, uh, I don't know who remembers, like the fork we had in March 2013, where the number of database locks in, in Berkeley DB uh, somehow caused us to reject particular blocks. Um, this was not something anyone even considered to be part of what the specification of the software would be, but still we had to somehow consider this part of, of how the software behaves. So um, this, this leads to, to like the, the motto that consistency is more important than correctness, usually. Uh, I, I imagine if someone would find a bug that allows anyone to steal anyone's coins, we might really want to, to change it. But if, if, if it's more subtle things than that, we typically do not want bugs to be fixed. Um, rather, we want to gain understanding about uh, what it is. And th this is, as I said, surprisingly hard and uh, extremely risky to do if you would like to re-implement these rules from scratch. I, I personally don't believe there's any complete implementation out there that is exactly identical and cannot be forked off. So um, then again, um, we, we do, of course, not all of Bitcoin is consensus critical and Bitcoin Core is right now what the network implements. So de facto, uh, Bitcoin Core is what defines the rules of the network. But Bitcoin Core does much more than just uh, de deciding whether blocks is, is valid. It implements the, the, the network protocol. It implements uh, different policies to prevent uh, DOS attacks. Uh, in, and it, ha it has various rules. And there are very good reasons why people would want to change these and experiment with new systems. But uh, I've always been of the opinion that trying to re-implement the consensus rules too is, is an um, unnecessarily risky thing to do. Um, unfortunately, before we never had an answer, but don't do it, right? Uh, so this is what, what uh, lib consensus hopefully can change is that we have an answer like you don't have to re-implement the consensus rules. You can use this, it's built from exactly the same software, so it should implement exactly the same thing. Um, that, that's maybe not even the most important change here, the, the existence of the library. I don't know uh, how much it will be used, but um, there was a very significant amount of changes necessary in the source code to get to this point where slowly we try to separate what is consensus rules and what isn't. Um, and th this is a long way because, well, to do so we need to touch the consensus code. Um, still, I, I'm very happy with the progress we've made in trying to modul modularize the code uh, further. Uh, there have been contributions from many people who, who uh, have uh, worked on this. So, um, then let me talk about WIP66. Um, sometimes we do want to make changes in the consensus rules, and this is one of them. And there's a really good reason for doing so. Um, so BIP66, BIP stands for Bitcoin Improvement Proposal, as I assume most of you know. Um, it, this one specifically suggests doing what we call a soft fork. So a soft fork is a backward compatible change to the consensus rules in Bitcoin. Uh, particularly what it um, does is it imposes an, an extra rule, something that was previously valid uh, now becomes invalid. And this has the nice advantage that you do not need the entire world to upgrade your software to, to do so. It's sufficient if a majority of miners impose this new rule as that guarantees that uh, things violating the rule will never be accepted in the blockchain and 
old nodes only accept more than new nodes, so they agree with it as well. So what this particular uh, BIP66 says is that it only allows strict DER signatures in transactions. So DER is a specific standard uh, that is uh, used for determining uh, how transactions are, uh, sorry, um, cryptographic signatures in Bitcoin transactions are serialized. Um, and so far in the past, Bitcoin Core and, and as a result, by definition, Bitcoin has always relied on OpenSSL signature parser. Uh, now, OpenSSL, as you may have heard, is a huge beast of code. Uh, there's various problems that are being found in it, and we've um, increasingly wanted to reduce our dependency uh, on this. However, as we rely on OpenSSL's huge amount of code that does the signature parsing, we can't just drop it because we need to replace it ident with, with something identical. And, and we feel this is uh, unnecessarily risky uh, to do. So instead of trying to do so, we will restrict uh, first what is valid on the network to be just a, a very well-defined subset. Uh, so we know exactly what, what, what is allowed in a signature and, and what isn't. Uh, now, this may sound like, like a big change, but in fact, the, um, these non-DER signatures, so the ones that don't exactly implement the, the subset, have been non-standard since Bitcoin 0 0.8, which next week is two years old. So uh, hopefully the network has adapted by now to, to not rely on these. Um, so, yes. Um, that's something that will take effect as soon as 75% of the network hash rate uh, adopts a version that implements this new rule. It's um, 75 because we don't want to make it go on and off uh, and not be entirely sure. At 95%, at it becomes mandatory for everything. So um, I'm, I'm really, it's something I've, I've wanted to see for a long time uh, in Bitcoin. So uh, I, I hope this, this uh, goes through. So um, that brings us to the next question. Uh, wouldn't we want to like to get rid of OpenSSL entirely in Bitcoin? So, so far, not yet. Uh, specifically because of the reason uh, outlined before the BIP66 will, will change. Um, but we have been working on a library called Lipsec P256K1. I did well, I, I did pick the name, but uh, it, it's, um, it refers to... <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I fully agree. Um, but it, it, it refers to the name of the elliptic curve that Bitcoin is using uh, for its, its uh, transaction signatures. So this was a, a personal project of mine like two years ago. Uh, I wanted to experiment with... Um, if we implemented everything in, in this, um, for this, this um, elliptic curve uh, from scratch, uh, because this, this it, it's, an, yeah, uh, not sure how familiar you are with elliptic curves, but it's the name of a specific elliptic curve, um, which is used for the cryptography here. Um, and this specific curve was picked in a specific way to allow, specific optimizations. Um, and so I was interested in seeing how much they would actually gain. Because OpenSSL has a very generic implementation of it. OpenSSL as such is reasonably optimized, but it has no specific optimization for this, this curve. So I wanted to see what, what this was like. And over time, uh, the project got a bit more attention. I got a ton of contributions from Greg Maxwell and Peter Detman, uh, who is a developer of the Java Bouncy Castle library as well. Um, in, in particular, we've done a ton of work on testing things, because people always say you shouldn't implement your own crypto. So. Uh, do as I say, don't do as I do, uh, I guess. But we do have some evidence that the testing we've been doing pays off. So um, not too long ago, 
um, randomly one of the unit tests in, in this library fail, just once and only for one specific instance. And, and this was very curious. Was this like a, a, a bit flip on a CPU or something? But I, so I tried to reproduce the bug. It took me several hours uh, to do so. And to my surprise, I found that the bug was not actually in libsecp, uh, but it was in OpenSSL. Uh, which I was comparing with. And, um, it, it turned out that the bug was actually in the BNSQR function which computes the square of a number. Um, it's a bug that had been in OpenSSL for 12 years. Um, only specifically for AMD64 and there was a bug in the assembly code when carry was missing. Um, so I by no means want to say that that uh, this library of ours, libsecp, is, is, is perfect and fully tested and has absolutely no bugs. If it was, we'd probably be using it already. But it, it is an indication uh, of, of, um, that our, our test practices pay off. Um, so what are we doing with this library? We're not using it for validation in Bitcoin yet because that would be a consensus change that we don't want to risk yet. Um, but what it does do is constant time and deterministic signing. So um, let me talk a minute about that. Um, this constant time thing is, is um, a particular attack that is possible on um, signature systems. So if, if you somehow have control over a computer system that has a private key, but you don't have access to the private key, but you can ask it to sign things, which is sort of true in the, in the case of a Bitcoin wallet. Um, it may be possible in some cases to extract information about that private key. Uh, one of the ways that this is done is by timing exactly how fast um, the, the, the signing process takes. So um, the, the typical uh, way for dealing with this is to write a constant time implementation. So you, you make uh, every operation you do, you never have an if or a loop condition that depends on secret data. Uh, and as far as we know, libsecp is the only implementation of, of a constant, fully constant time mechanism for the specific curve that Bitcoin has. Specifically, OpenSSL does not. Um, in, in addition, by doing this, we also have deterministic signing. Um, following a standard called RFC 6979. Um, this is nice because um, it means you don't need randomness when creating a transaction signature. Uh, it also means that if you sign the same transaction twice, you get the same signature. Uh, and so it, it simplifies testing to, to, to a large extent as well. Uh, so there, there's a link there to, to the project. We're still actively developing it. Okay. Um, I guess I'll also tell you something about the changes in the build process. So um, you may or may not know, Bitcoin is using a deterministic build process called Gitian, uh, which was originally developed by Myron Kupperman, I think, if I now pronounce his name correctly, um, which uh, allows you to build um, Bitcoin or any process using Gitian uh, from source in a deterministic environment and the result of this is that you get a byte for byte exactly the same output as developers are using to produce the binaries. Um, when I talk about this with people, they sometimes say, why don't you just sign the code? Well, of course we use code signing too, but it does not accomplish the same goal. So what this deterministic building uh, allows you to do is not only, our source code is public. Everyone can see what the source code is and hopefully there are many eyes that, that scrutinize what, what's happening there. Um, and you can have binaries that get signed by developers, but this does not give you a guarantee that this binary was exactly the result of uh, this specific source code that people are watching. So we want to tie them together, and this is what this deterministic build uh, process uses. I'm, I'm pretty proud that Bitcoin uses this, and it, it has very little attention, I think. Um, so this, this process has been extended with 0.10, uh, mostly, uh, nearly entirely the work of Corey Fields. Um, and 
what's happened is that there is now a sort of mini dependency building system inside the Bitcoin source code, uh, which allows you to build, for, at least if you're building from Linux, uh, for any, any of the supported systems. So you can build for OS X, you can build for Windows, uh, and, and so on. So um, right now, we also have these deterministic binaries for uh, Mac OS X uh, in, in 0 0.10. So this is a, a new change. Uh, okay, um, what else was I going to talk about? Oh yes, I'll also tell you something about fee estimation. So um, finally in 0 0.10, there will be code that is measuring the exact uh, usage of fees on the network. And what this will allow us to do, hopefully, is to get a closer feedback loop so wallets don't need to hard code uh, specific limits this is what, what, what happened before, right? If fees were a result of, of what miners were doing or uh, of uh, transaction pressure on the network or anti-DOS rules. And as the value of Bitcoin changes over time and the size of block changes over time, or at least how, how full they are, um, we, we had to ad ad adapt the fees that, that were being used on the network several times. And, and um, it shouldn't be software that sets what these, so, what these fees are. So um, this, this hopefully enables sort of a market for fees, so you pay more for faster confirmation. Um, I, I'm curious about this, what, uh, what will happen, but I, I think it's very necessary. Um, something else we have is uh, watch-only wallets. So uh, I know that the uh, wallet in Bitcoin Core has not received all that much attention compared to many other projects, but at least there are some things we try to do right. Um, and one thing that was, that was definitely missing was watch-only wallets. So people like to query Bitcoin D or, or other full nodes for information about particular transactions, but this is, this is really not a very scalable uh, way of implementing larger systems as it, it inherently relies on having access to every every single block in, in the blockchain and having it indexed so to, to build um, block explorer like websites for example. Um, in particular this will not be compatible with uh, another change that I'll be talking about later for a future version which is pruning. If we ever want to get rid of storing every single block uh, on disk, we, you, you cannot just query any transaction anymore. So you need a way uh, to counter this and watch only wallets are a really nice way of doing it. You can uh, watch for any address or key or script and consider it yours, uh, try to create transactions for them. Of course you can't sign them, but you can bring them to the system for signing. So I hope people experiment with this. Um, then let me briefly talk about some numbers. Uh, so just to show you that Bitcoin development has not stopped. It may not be the most sexy, sexy things we are doing, but there is really a lot of work going on here. As you can see, uh, the differences between incremental versions, and this is two or three years back we have to go here, um, has really increased. And in the last version, we, we have apparently uh, 100 contributors who have uh, worked on the code. We do have more um, detailed release notes and I definitely encourage you to go look at them. I'll uh, briefly go over them. Here they are. <laughs> there we go. Um, <laughs> um, so th th these release notes will be published uh, along with the binary uh, and, and the releases. It's public now too. Yeah, sure, everything is public. <laughs> Why am I giving this talk? You could just like watch <laughs> GitHub. Um, still, l l let me very briefly say something about what may be in store for 0 0.11. You'll notice many question marks um, as well things will be in whenever they're ready. But w one very interesting thing uh, I hope people agree is pruning. Um, to, to set things straight, pruning allows you to run a full node with uh, much less storage, in particular, you're not storing the entire blockchain anymore. You're still downloading and processing the entire blockchain. It's just your long-term storage that, that uh, 
juice. This, this is a result of changes that were made in 0 0.8 uh, before, which was actually called ultra prune at the time, only the pruning part was never implemented. Um, there's a pull request now, and, and I have good hopes they will go in, in 0 0.11. Um, there's two more soft forks that are in the pipeline that missed 0 0.10 due to uh, unforeseen complications. One is BIP62, uh, protection from malleability. So um, malleability is the principle that allows you to take a transaction that broadcast over the network, change some things in it, and it remains valid, even if you are not the sender of the transaction. Uh, and this breaks many higher level protocols that rely on being able to refer to the specific output of a particular of a particular transaction, um, as this is done by hash and the hash changes. Um, another is BIP65 or check lock time verify, uh, which allows you to create transaction outputs that enforce a particular lock time. Um, there's people who know know much more about the applications of this, um, but, but it is uh, pretty interesting. Uh, apart from that, um, maybe we'll get a new wallet. There, there is some new interest in the wallet code and some people who would like to work on it, so maybe we get a reboot there, maybe it moves to a separate repository or uh, we can choose between an old and a new one. Um, maybe we'll get SPV support. Um, so uh, making it possible to run Bitcoin Core as a light wallet, which does not actually even download or validate the blockchain, but relies on a majority of hash rate of vouching, like uh, Electrum and uh, all Bitcoin J-based projects, like uh, Bitcoin Wallet for Android and Multibit, I believe. Um, hopefully we'll get better modularity. There's been a lot of work in that already, but there's still a lot to do. Uh, the code base we inherited from Satoshi wasn't all that clean. Um, and, and maybe we'll get uh, faster validation through LibSecP 256K1 if we actually feel that it's ready for uh, prime time adoption. Uh, the, this, this, the, the speed up could be, could be pretty significant, like factor five or more uh, we get for signature validation. Okay, I think that's it. Uh, thank you for your attention. You mentioned that uh, a consensus code shouldn't be attempted to be rewritten, but I know a lot of parties, including actually Gavin, have mentioned that we should have more implementations. Obviously, if you just have one other one, that can easily cause a fork. If you have three, five other implementations, so the bug in one, you potentially get outvoted with multiple. So it, it, it is okay. true that if if we get to a state where there are many different consensus implementations that uh, have all had significant somehow obtained trust, that, that this is the case. But it's also true that if you have uh, five different implementations, it's not just five differences, but it's also now quadratic many uh, combinations of, of implementations that may conflict with each other. So um, I, I am really scared about this. I, I, um, of course, we, we can't control the future and people are free to implement what they want, but uh, I think it, it, it is extremely and un unnecessarily risky to, to uh, re-implement the consensus part. To, to be clear, I am not saying no other implementations of all the rest. Uh, th there are very good reasons for, for doing so. We need competition there, and uh, in particular things like, uh, I, I don't believe developers of one specific implementation should uh, get to decide uh, all policy rules on the network. So. Um, so th that, that's a good reason, but also experimentation with, with just other software. Still, I, I believe consensus code should be treated differently. So I was really looking forward to BIP65. Can you explain why I didn't get into version 0.10? Um, simply wasn't ready, I think. Uh, I, I believe even the author agreed that, that it wasn't. Uh, there's an implementation, and um, but 
these things are, are risky. I mean, they, they, they are uh, deliberate changes to the consensus code, and uh, we need eyes on them. And I think BIP65 was really close when uh, to, was only implemented really close to the time when like the, the merge window for features for 0 0.10 was closing. Um, maybe, so to add, um, it, it's a bit, I, I've presented it here as the BIP66 is now part of 0 0.10, but soft forks really need implementation in many versions because we will not be able to convince everyone to upgrade to 0 0.10, nor should we. Uh, so th there's backport. So uh, I'm just trying to say there's no um, real reason why this needs to be part of a release. It can be done in a point release at several uh, things at once if, if there's sufficient interest in review and, and everything. Is the fee estimation update, does that actually set a rule, like a, the relay fee between nodes, or is it something the user can sort of look at and decide? Um, so specifically, it here refers to the code in the wallet. Only. So it, it's, I, I believe it's only used to guide uh, the decision of how much fee the wallet adds to a particular transaction. I don't think the relay uh, it has been adapted yet. Maybe that, that happens. It really has a command line parameter to set it, but the relay limits are very, very low by default. And they can be adjusted via command line parameter. But the fee estimation stuff doesn't change that. But the relay fees are mostly, this is a, there's a rule in Bitcoin Core that won't relay transactions that either don't have priority, meaning they're spending old coins, or don't pay some fee below a small threshold. And this prevents a bunch of gnarly DOS attacks where people flood the network with transactions that take up a bunch of bandwidth. So that rule is really not intended to get in the way of much of anything. It should be low enough. Where the dynamic fee estimation stuff is doing is changing fees at a much you know, sort of higher value level than that to allow you to target getting certain confirmation counts on your transactions. It's the distinction between uh, first you need to get your transaction relayed on, across the network, but that's not enough. You need to get it mined as well. So it's mostly about this. Uh, the one you buy best for <coughs> the blockchain, is it the size of the UTXO or is it something else? It's, it's uh, size of the UTXO, it's the block header index. It also contains a few, some time of, of actual blocks because we need to be able to deal with reorganization, so you need the latest blocks. And in addition, we also have undo data for unrolling the effects of particular blocks on the UTXO set, again, for, for uh, uh, reorganizations. So, yes, um, it, it's a few hundred megabyte worth of blocks plus a few hundred megabytes of, of UTXO set data. Yeah. Has all the consensus code been extracted with the consensus yet? No, just it, so it's, it's not even, um, so, uh, so far, right now, it's just script. Um, and most of the work that we've been doing is uh, disentangling the script code from dependencies on, on the wider code base of Bitcoin. So in particular, it, it does not depend on Boost. Um, uh, we'd, we'd obviously also like to make, get rid of OpenSSL, but so far that's, as I've explained, not possible. Um, but uh, yeah, we're, we're trying to make it small and, and S size is, is sort of um, an estimator for how well we have extracted it from things. So we, we definitely hope to uh, improve that and, and get things like UTXO set management uh, and block level validation things into lib consensus, though there's no real clear plan for how that's going to happen. So does the lead consensus take parameters like uh, the customize maybe some constants? Uh, no, um, it it implements Bitcoin's consensus rules exactly and, and nothing else. So for example, the data carrier side. The That's not a consensus rule. That's a policy rule, and lib lib consensus very specifically avoids making any policy decisions. This is sort of a political. Uh, thing like the, there's projects that do not want to use any of the Bitcoin code base because you now Bitcoin developers get get things to say. But this is not true for the consensus code, we, so we try to only make it do that. What it does do, it takes a flag to say which soft forks ha have 
been applied. So if uh, so for P2SH, BIP16, uh, pay to script hash, so you can tell it whether or not to apply that rule, and now for BIP66 you can also tell it whether to apply BIP66 or not. Oh, I have a question. Sure. Um, in adopting a new rule for consensus, you mentioned 75 percent. Yep. How do miners indicate whether or not they're voting yes or no? On the they, they increase the version number in, in a block. Oh. So Wouldn't that be incompatible? Sorry? Wouldn't that be incompatible, though? Uh, in what way? Um, if you increase the version number, they wouldn't accept it yet. Oh, they, they do. No, so... Um, Bitcoin nodes, you, you can set Bitco Bitcoin block versions to any number. Uh, and if the software does not know about a particular version, it will warn. And if there's many of them, it will sorry, uh, warn loudly. Um, but it, it uses the rules that, uh, that it knows. And as a software can only strengthen the rules, the, the, the uh, there shouldn't be a problem, right? Uh, new, old code should always accept new, higher version numbers as we only make things stricter. Um, so this, this was a mechanism that was introduced in BIP34, the height in, coi uh, height in Coinbase, which requires miners to put the, the block height number inside the Coinbase. Um, and that mechanism increased the used version number two instead of one. So as soon as 75% uh, switched to version number two, this rule became, uh, this height in Coinbase became required. And as soon as it hit 95%, um, it became illegal to use a version one. So there, thereby forcing the entire network to up update. And I think it, it took like half a year or so before to reach the 75% and then a week to get to 95% because everyone was suddenly scared that, that uh, <laughs> it was going to happen or, or a few big pools suddenly switched. Uh, I, I don't know the details anymore. Okay. Uh, I think I saw a question there. Um, that process, do people use one higher version number to indicate they want to make the move and then bump it again as soon as they see the 75 percent reach? So there are like two steps. So, uh, sorry, could you repeat? So, so uh, well, how far back is the look back on the version numbers? Okay, uh, a thousand blocks. Okay, so so uh, 75 percent of the past thousand blocks are there. Do the people who agree still just use the version number which says we agree, or do they now use another version number which say no. we also it, saw 75 percent? Uh, every, everybody sees the same because it's within one chain. So there's never any possible disagreement about these percentages. Nice thing about using a blockchain. Uh, so what, what we use is uh, you look back a thousand blocks. If 750 of them, of the past thousand blocks, have the new number plus the one you're validating yourself also has it. So it's actually 751 uh, out of a thousand and one. Uh, then the new rule becomes in effect for that block. And there's only one, one number that's being used. So we're now increasing to version uh, 3 for uh, PIP 66. What if, for some strange reason, then it drops below 75? Then the rule stops being in effect again. Um, th there are some, some ideas about a better mechanism here because uh, so th th this system works nicely in, in allowing miners to adopt a new rule or not, but we don't have a clear thing to do what if they disagree. Uh, nor can we try to introduce a new change before the previous one has completely rolled out. And there's some vague proposal uh, about using different bits in the version field rather than incremental versions for, for doing this. Uh, I've been writing up, but first 0.10. Yeah. I'm really interested in uh, the solution to transaction malleability. Is, mm -hmm. that, is that kind of a done deal for 11, and when would that be? Um, so 0 0.11 is, is scheduled for within half a year. Uh, July, like this one, was scheduled for December, you know. Um, but uh, it, it's a done deal as in I don't know of any known problems with it. There's implementation, there's test factors, 
Uh, there's been a lot of review and a lot of discussion about it. The only problem with it was that there was a lot of discussion right before 0.10's uh, release window closed and some, not problems, but unexpected things like someone like say, hey, did you notice it had this effect? Like, actually no. Um, and that's not a good feeling to have right before, so you, you don't want, you never ever want to rush these things. So um, unfortunately it got <coughs> postponed. Uh, though most of the changes in BIP62 have been adopted as standardness rules, except there is one we can't because, um, so there's uh, one specific uh, malleability, it's the inherent malleability in ECDSA signatures. Um, so you have the R and S value within a signature and you can flip the sign of the S value without affecting the valid validity of, um, of a transaction. And where we can't change the CDSA. So um, we, we could uh, force every wallet in the world to adopt a rule where only half of the range is used, but the, the solution that BIP62 uses is uh, using a new version number on transactions. And when this uh, happens, you indicate that you want your transaction to be treated with stricter rules. So th this allows uh, uh, wallet software to, to upgrade at their leisure and it becomes an opt-in thing to get your transaction protected from malleability. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about uh, how enabling pruning on a new node would affect the initial synchronization process, especially with uh, not at all. Uh, it, w what happens is we still download as we do before. We uh, fetch headers, we validate them, we fetch the blocks. Uh, only whenever we have validated up to a particular point, we delete the blocks that were old enough. Uh, and th this is actually one of the reasons why we use this thousand wind block window for fetching to prevent too far um, uh, out of orderness of blocks. So you know that if you have validated up to a particular block, then you can always delete blocks a thousand back without affecting something further on. So we, we, we create, I think, 128 megabyte files with blocks. And this was specifically done with the purpose of one day being able to, to prune them. So you, we just delete an entire file of 128 megabytes at a time. Uh, what do you thoughts about the uh, block size limit? Or what, what's, uh, increase is notable or? I, I was uh, hoping to avoid this question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no. Um, I believe the block size should be increased to as much as the network supports, but there are many things that are, in my opinion, not yet uh, investigated enough to make that decision right now. Great. <laughs> um, what do you think about increasing up returns back to 80 bytes? Uh, I believe that's been merged in master. Uh, yes, um, I'm not. It, it, it. Uh, sorry? How do you feel about more data being used in non traditional way? So I, be I believe that Bitcoin users have. So what this does is it increases costs for nodes and, and every uh, user of the Bitcoin network. And Bitcoin users who are not interested in these use cases have an interest in avoiding this. Um, others don't, and, and that's fine. But um, the problem with op return is that it is censorable. So if you are, yeah. Um, Yes, or, or, or if a large majority of the Bitcoin network agreed that this stuffing was too bad and they would 
make a soft fork, making op return illegal, it, it could be done. I'm not saying that I, I expect this to happen, but it, it is a concern. So I think, um, I, I have not seen so many use cases of op return that are actually useful. Uh, so either they're blockable or censorable, they have bad privacy, uh, and if it's just for timestamping, there are mechanisms for doing this that don't require any data at all and are indistinguishable. So uh, the, the, the original reason for adding op return was to have an easy way for people to make commitments to external data within transactions. 40 bytes was enough for that. Um, and, and that's not really what is being used for. So I, I have very mixed feelings about it. Yes, yeah, you, you, in, in 0 0.10 you, you can say how much you are willing to relay, so for miners or a full node. So you can automatically give people a free ride on your... Yes, you can. Okay, that's, um, right. that's I guess the reward I was asking for this release. Yeah. That is there. Okay, cool. Thank you. Anything else? Come on, one more question. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> you just beat you guys up that bad. Yeah. So it, it depends what you think full nodes are useful for. Uh, th there is, of course, the function that they have, that, which is serving data to other nodes. And this is obviously reduced by the fact that there might be less nodes now that can serve historical block data. Um, but on the other hand, um, I think the most important function of a full node if you still want to call that a full node, if it's a pruned one, um, is the ability of a Bitcoin user to run a system and know that nobody in this entire blockchain is cheating. I mean, the, 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 this is a, a fundamental uh, thing in Bitcoin that, that is offered by the system that exists nowhere else, the ability to have a financial system where I don't have to trust anyone. The way I do that is by being able to run something that tells me that everything is fine. Um, and pruning helps this because uh, it, uh, not having historical data is not essential for this function. Um, but yes, it, it is a question. And, um, we may need uh, mechanisms to more efficiently find which nodes have which data. It, it, it's not such a hard problem. I mean, um, the, the blockchain is just a bunch of gigabytes of data. People download torrents and, and there's huge files being served over the internet everywhere. Um, this, this is a much easier technical problem than the, the validation and the relay of transactions and everything else that goes on in a Bitcoin network. But so, so just merge the torrent and the <laughs> well, uh, I, I think headers first is superior actually right now uh, <laughs> because it allows you to do validation at the same time as you are fetching, and, and it, it actually downloads at several megabytes per second. Um, but yes, so th th there's, there's a concern here. And uh, the initial version of pruning that might be merged uh, simply disables you as a full node. So it, it does not advertise at all anymore and it also disables the wallet. So that's hopefully some extra reason for people not, not to do it. Uh, later we might need protocol extensions to find like, that, that, that nodes can advertise up to where they have blocks and you, you connect to the ones you need. All right, now that'll be our last question. Everybody give it up for Peter. Thank you so much.